Let me know you're ready. <clears throat> All right, today is Monday, June 27, 2011. I'm interviewing Austin Mayor Lee Leffingwell at the Austin City Hall in Austin, Texas, as part of the Veterans History Project, uh, which is uh, run by the Library of Congress. Uh, this uh, interview will be archived with the Library of Congress for all to mm -hmm. see in future years. And uh, thank you so much for participating in this in this interview. Uh, Mr. Leffingwell is 71 years old, having been born on October 13th, 1939. My name is Michael McCall, and I'll be doing the interview. I'm a U.S. Congressman in Texas Congressional District 10. Uh, first question, uh, Mayor, uh, is uh, if you could state for the record what war and branch of service that you served in? Uh, I was in the United States Navy, and I uh, have about credit for about a year and a half service in the Vietnam theater. And then what, uh, what was your rank when, uh, during service? Uh, well, let's see. I, I think started off a little lower than higher. Well, well, I started off, of course, like most people in the Navy, as an ensign. Yeah. And uh, I went directly out of college to OCS in Pensacola, commissioned an ensign, went through flight training. I think by the time I got to squadron, I might have been a lieutenant junior grade and then a lieutenant before I got off active duty. Lieutenant in the Navy is the same as captain in the Army for mm -hmm. some people need to know that. And so before we get into your uh, specific military service, I just want to kind of touch on your background and you know, where okay. you were born and raised, the influence your family had, and you know, perhaps you know, other members serving uh, within your family. Yeah, uh, well, my, my dad was, uh, of course, World War II age, but he, he never served in the military because he worked for the city of Austin in a critical occupation and didn't go. But a lot, of course, a lot of people in my family did. And uh, of particular note, um, my dad's first cousin, Edward, Edward Gary from San Marcos, uh, was killed on December 7th, 1941 at Clark Field in the Philippines. He was a bomber pilot and he was killed while he was running across uh, the tarmac to get to his airplane to take off because they knew the zeros were coming. He didn't make it. Did that have an impact on you at an early age at all? Or? Uh, it, it actually did uh, because I remember visiting my grandmother uh, in San Marcos and her sister who was his mother was right around the corner and I visited her house all the time and she really never got over it. Uh, he was her only son and, I, and his, his room was always there uh, and his clothes were always hanging in the closet press and she would always take me up to his room and show me uh, his memorabilia, pictures and so forth. Uh, and she always kept his presence in her home and, and I was of course always made aware of the sacrifice that he had made. Did you at that time uh, think about uh, military service, or was it not till a later date? That well, actually, it wasn't till later. You know, I, I I probably had some thoughts about it when I was a kid, yeah, but I really made the decision to go into the military when I was a, a student at the University of Texas, and about to graduate. And uh, things were, you know, of course, at that time we had a draft, uh, and it could be considered likely that I would go in anyway. Uh, but Vietnam was just starting up. It was uh, not a very active war at that time, but everybody sort of felt that it would be. And so I made the decision, uh, I do want to serve my country, and what would I like to do best? I'd like to fly airplanes, and so I contacted my local Navy recruiter. Actually, they contacted me. They come to campus and went directly to, entered the Navy and went to OCS in Pensacola. Got there in October of uh, 1962. I remember it very well. Um, I arrived at something they call the Indoctrination Battalion at <laughs> 10 o'clock at night. And uh, at 10 o'clock at, <laughs> at night, went to bed in a bunk in a large room with a lot of other cadets and uh, woke up uh, well, as I was waked up at five o'clock the next morning to begin my indoctrination. And uh, it was an experience that was equal to nothing I'd ever seen before in my life. <laughs> and uh, looking back on it, uh, you know, I'm glad I went through it. I'm glad it's behind me. Uh, the funniest thing that happened was the first day uh, after we'd been out doing various things, um, military training exercise, 
uh, getting paper signed, things like that, was uh, the sar we were trained by Marines, uh, sergeants, and uh, usually a Marine captain was a battalion commander. Uh, got us in a big room, said, okay, you guys, bring all the stuff you brought with you to Pensacola. And they brought, we brought, so we brought all of our stuff into this room and they had packing materials, boxes and tape and so forth. And they said, what you're going to do is put all the stuff you brought with you into these boxes and send it home because you're not going to need it here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of the guys uh, straight off the campus college had brought their golf clubs. <laughs> and that is a definition of an optimist right there. <laughs> <laughs> so they thought they were going to go golfing. Yeah, you know? maybe on Saturdays or something like That's that. Right. So you're uh, tw like 21 years old at the time? Or? Uh, yes, uh, so I was just turning. I was just turning 22. Yeah, okay. I was just graduated. From I was, UT uh, and yeah, it's 1962. That's right. Very early in the Vietnam conflict. Very, very early. Yeah. And, uh, and then of course President Kennedy, I guess, was assassinated that next month. Uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Yeah, he was assassinated while I was still in flight training. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, flight training in the Navy was uh, about 14 months, as I recall, mm -hmm. and he was assassinated in November 1963. I remember it very well because. Uh, I had just completed basic jet training at Meridian, Mississippi, McCain Field. Mm -hmm. Not John, the John McCain you know, but his father was also a Navy Admiral, right. named after him. And I was, I was going down on my way to uh, Corpus Christi for advanced training, and I was at my parents' house in Austin here to stop over, and that's when I heard the news. Yeah, it shocked the nation, I'm sure the military as well. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it was... Uh, uh, you know, that's thankfully that's one of those things that doesn't happen uh, mm -hmm. very often in a lifetime, if at all. So, yeah. and then and then a Texan gets in the White House, Lyndon Johnson. Right. And, uh, the war starts to escalate, and um, so tell me about you did. What was basic training like? Uh, we, we've always heard that's a pretty intense. Uh, you mean a, uh, yeah, basic training, uh, officer candidate school, uh, same thing for officers. Uh, lots of memories there, some funny, the one uh, the story I just told you I thought was funny. Uh, I can, re and of course we had, we would have formation every morning before we went to breakfast and another quick funny story is uh, we would be inspected of course by the marine drill sergeants and we'd be in formation and I remember looking up uh, and the guy right in front of me, I was on the second row and he had his uh, cap on backwards, you know, these little. Uh, and the, of course, the ornament was on the back, <laughs> and uh, I could not keep from smiling, and it cost me five demerits. Ouch. Yeah, because I was smiling in formation, and you're not supposed to do that. You know? yeah, that's so, why he had his cap. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, you know, he was fat, dumb, and happy. He didn't know anything about it. Uh, but there's also some uh, very tough lessons that you learn. Uh, I could tell a couple of stories if you want me to. Sure. Um, well, I remember when we first, the first time I went to the obstacle course, and I remember I went in in October, so this is probably November, even though it's Florida, it's cool and, and uh, damp frequently. So we had to uh, run or jog about three miles out to the obstacle course, and then we had to all go through, uh, through the course, and we had to complete it in a certain amount of time to be uh, qualified. And so we did that, and there were a few of us that didn't, I, I qualified, fortunately. There were a few that didn't, and so we jogged back to, uh, after doing that, jogged back to the battalion uh, building, and the drill sergeant met us out in front. And he asked for a report on the on the exercise, and did, and the uh, person in charge, the squad leader, said um, so so and so did not pass, and so and so did not. But there were about three of them, I think. And we were all totally exhausted. It was raining. We we're standing in the rain late in the afternoon, just gone through this ordeal of about a six mile run plus. Uh, the pretty uh, exhausting experience of the course itself and so he says okay you three get back out there and do it again 
So they had to jog back out there and do it again oh. and come back. Another uh, six miles? <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of in the rain did, so did that prepare you for the 5k runs in austin <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and, and there are a lot of stories about that I, I, i've often said that uh uh you can do a lot more than you think you can mm -hmm. when you're when you're you can take a lot more abuse and you can uh, do a lot more physical uh, activity than you think you can once you get into it uh, you just have to keep doing it. When you're really tested, and I guess they really tested you. They they test you, yeah. So you know, officer candidate school was how many months, and then um, it was 16 weeks. 16 weeks. Yeah. And then uh, uh, and then you're deployed to Vietnam. Well, no, they went, went through flight training. Went through flight training. Went through flight, uh, went training. Went through flight yeah. training. Uh, everybody starts off at uh, softly field primary flight training in a small type airplane, mm -hmm. T-34. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know what that is or not, but a uh, uh, T-34 is, it's bigger than like a Cessna, more powerful and faster than like a Cessna, this airplane. And he says, okay, you take it and give me a left turn. And uh, so I said, well, I'm thinking to myself, which way do you push the stick here to make it turn left? <laughs> you know, intuitively well, I would think, right turn, push it to the left, but uh, maybe it's, you know, it's an airplane, it's complicated, maybe so. So I'm thinking I'll try a little bit and see what happens, and then if I'm wrong, I can go back the other way. So I start moving the stick to the left a little bit, and the airplane's kind of going like this very slowly. And he wrestles the stick out of my hand from the back, grabs it, and says, GD. <laughs> In the future, when I ask you to make a turn, I want at least 45 degrees of bank. <laughs> so I so, was kind of off to a bad start there, but uh, finished primary training. You only get like about 35 hours or so, and uh, then you go on to basic training. In my case, I went to Meridian, Mississippi, uh, not too far away from there, but. Uh, rural setting and uh, my first time ever in a jet airplane and uh, the first thing I noticed about being in a jet versus uh, the prop airplane I'd flown in primary was how quiet it was. Mm -hmm. You're sitting there because all the noise is behind you. In front of you is nothing but the nose of the airplane. And, and it goes a little faster. Doesn't it? Well, a little faster, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so eventually, so you finished uh, flight school and, and uh, the basic training. And yeah. That, and at, the, at that point, they, you were uh, deployed to, uh, to Vietnam? Uh, I went to my squadron, which was a C-130 squadron, mm -hmm. uh, based in New Jersey. And uh, we, for the first about year and a half I was in, uh, it was great. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to be in that squadron, because we deployed to Europe all the time. Uh, in fact, our base of operations was a little town, a little base in a, in a town near uh, the town of Chateau, France. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so we would typically fly over there and fly missions all over Europe, out of there, and uh, into Spain and the Middle East, and, and got a lot of flying in the Middle East, uh, Germany, uh, UK. And then we come back for a while and go back and forth. So that was uh, pretty good duty until about 65. And they said, all you guys that have been going east now are now going west. Uh, so we would, uh, we would deploy over there on temporary duty for periods of time and fly in and out of, of Vietnam and surrounding areas. A lot of Thailand, a lot of Philippines, up to Japan, different bases. Uh, in Vietnam itself, Nha Trang, Da Nang, Saigon, and Thailand, uh, Ubon and Udorn, uh, Bactan Air Base in the Philippines, which uh, for educational purposes is right across the strait from Cebu City where Magellan was killed. Hmm. <laughs> uh, C-130 is a pretty, I've been in one in Iraq, it's a very large uh, transport plane. Yeah, it's a it's an old workhorse airplane, uh, been around for years. I think the first models came out in probably the 1950s, and believe it or not, they're still making them today, you know, upgraded models. And it's a very versatile airplane because it uh, can fly reasonably high and fast. It's a turboprop airplane, four engine. Uh, and it, uh, it's versatile in that you can 
you can equip it to go fairly long range, like transoceanic. Uh, but at the same time, it has uh, short takeoff and landing capabilities, and so you take advantage of that. A lot of uh, uh, short and unimproved runways in Vietnam, especially uh, when I first got there, uh, some of the fields were marshed and matting, which is a, you know, they take a bulldozer and they grade an area and then they just roll this metal mesh out on it and unfold it. Uh, so the uh, C-130 was, you could do that uh, where you couldn't do that in the bigger airplanes that carried things around like the C-141, a lot of those around, and uh, of course the C-135 to a limited extent. And so you're over there. It was around like 1965. Uh, first time I went over was in '65. Mm -hmm. Deployed over there, uh, riding in a C Air Force C-135, uh, and I got off of active duty in 1967. So it was pretty well escalating throughout the entire time over there. So you were really there. Um, when it was during the, the height of really the escalation that was taking place from yeah. 1970 was pretty can you describe that that was that was during the build up and you know there were a lot of uh, a lot of people moving around because a lot of soldiers and their equipment had to be brought in they were establishing new bases all over the country uh, they had air force command but, uh, posts at, at small bases that uh, could act as uh, 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 supply posts for the surrounding area and support of uh, the troops in the field, Army and Marines. A, a lot of activity, uh, a lot of moving very basic stuff around, a lot of moving soldiers and Marines around uh, and their equipment and unfortunately uh, I had the very sad and sometimes unnerving experience of, of bringing a lot of human remains back to our country. Uh, we would normally come back to Travis Air, Air Force Base, mm -hmm. which is near San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, and you know it was—it's a very disconcerting feeling to look back there in the cargo compartment and see uh, stacks of aluminum boxes. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would think that would be mm -hmm. one of the hardest. Yeah, obviously in terms of cargo, that, that uh, very difficult to. Bear with that them. was one of the more uh, difficult things for me. It's still tough to think about sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're flying at a relatively low altitude, or what's your altitude? Oh, no, the C-130 has a fairly high, uh, I mean, you're talking about 18,000 feet would be a good cruise altitude, okay. sometimes a little bit higher, but of course you got to get lower than that to land. To land. <laughs> that's Normally, tricky. that's a tricky part. So we had developed uh, techniques to try to minimize our time and uh, uh, I, I think still to this day they call it a Vietnam approach where you stay as high as you can until you're just almost passing the runway and then just drop it in. That's when we landed in Baghdad, it was yeah. that same yeah. type of, yeah. so you're trying Probably. to avoid the, uh, minimize the risk as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, stay as high as you can back. because, you know, the, they pretty well know there's no heavy armament out there that's going to bother you. They can control that for a while, but they what they can't control is individuals with rifles, military rifles coming in and uh, with the right kind of technique and the right numbers they can bring an airplane down with mm -hmm. that stuff. And I guess that did happen on occasion. Uh, we had one CV, C, Navy C-130 that was brought down were uh, sure by ground fire mm -hmm. and uh, he just stayed, he was took off out in a train and was flying up the coast and just stayed. He was trying, he was headed for Japan, uh, taking some people up there for R&R, &R, and uh, he just, he was trying to get an instrument clearance, uh, and that's the way you normally had to, you had to wait to get in the air to get an instrument clearance. And he was trying to get through on the radios to Saigon Radio and stay below a deck of clouds at the same time, and he just stayed too low, too long. Do you so recall the rest of us just driving through the clouds, you know. Right. <laughs> Do you uh, recall any time being under fire at all, or and if so, what was that like uh, experience? Well, I, you know, you're always aware of it, and I personally was never in an airplane that was significantly damaged. Uh, the only way you normally you would see a bullet hole in the skin of the airplane, which they could patch pretty quickly. 
but I was not, you know, in, ever in a situation where I was, oh my gosh, we're, we're being shot at and we're, we may have to go down. It was not like that. It would be incidental, something you would discover after, mm -hmm. after you landed. Anything else, else about your time in Vietnam mm -hmm. that you would mm -hmm. want to mention? Uh, well, you know, I, I think it was probably, uh, at that time, it was the longest war in American history. And of course, we've surpassed that now with operations in Iraq, but uh, I, 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 I'm a very patriotic person and I support our military 100 uh, percent. At the same time, I would hope that our national leaders would do their best to try to, of course, try to avoid war at all costs, but if you get involved in one, you got to be, you got to be totally committed, I think. Uh, and we talked about that before. Yeah. You know, some of the, maybe some of the lessons learned from Vietnam. What could you? Uh, what kind of wisdom do you have, kind of coming out of that experience? And what what, what do we learn from Vietnam? The whole experience. Well, I, I think one of the things uh, that we learned was not to uh, underestimate the the enemy, the people you're you're fighting. You may think they're ill-equipped, uh, badly trained, et cetera, but the, if they're highly motivated, and a highly motivated indigenous population can persist and uh, stay in the field for a very long time, and it, this is not the first time it's happened, of course, but this was a, a war that was different from the wars in the past where armies clash in the fields and, you know, they they have this battle and everything's over. The, in Vietnam, the the battle was everywhere. Yeah. You know, uh, there were, it was war not. War. There weren't. And there were some incidents of incidences of battles where there was a clear victory, but uh, by one side or the other. But most of it was just skirmishes uh, and no clear result for anything. You know, clear out, clear out an area, and then next week it's back like it was again. Do you think not being able to cross over the parallel in North Vietnam was a, a hindrance? Well, I mean, looking at it from my 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 view, which is not the uh, thirty thousand foot view that the people that make these decisions are at, uh, and I, I don't want to try to second guess anybody, but I would say certainly there was a problem with having, uh, from my point of observation, and I was not on the ground in combat, but, but uh, having an enemy that could run across the line and you're safe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that makes it very difficult. If there's a safe haven for somebody uh, that they can run to and access, uh, then it makes it very difficult to Do you, I think survive. Since against you know, I know Colin Powell and others have said, we, like, if we get involved in the conflict, we need a clearly defined mission, and you need to go full force. I mean, do you agree with that? I do. Yes. Yeah, interesting. You talk about right now we're in a conflict where they run into Pakistan, the tribal areas, for safe haven as they mm -hmm. cross in Afghanistan. Of course, there we go. And back then you had um, Cambodia was a similar mm -hmm. issue. Do you see those? I think similar. Uh, they are. They they seem to be very similar. Yeah, and uh, the the dealing with a committed indigenous population seems to be another similarity there. Uh, I, it's going to be very difficult to see a good result, I think, out of that. And it has been long term. Tell us about the, uh, you know, when you came back home, what year was it, 67? Uh, uh, I got off active duty in 67. And you were in the reserve for many years after that. Yeah, yeah, I stayed in for 15 to get my 20 years, and I'm glad I did. I was having a good time. That's, I, I didn't stay with any long range plan. Uh, I stayed primarily because uh, I was having a good time and, and enjoying that part. And you know, when I got out, I went to work for an airline, uh, for Delta Airlines, as a matter of fact, uh, in Atlanta. And for the, I guess, the first few years, we were always afraid we were going to get furloughed anyway. So I said, I better get some kind of paycheck. So I stayed in the reserves. Tell tell us about the homecoming. You know, my dad, World War Two. You know, they came home to a ticker tape parade uh, and other conflicts. I know mm -hmm. today, you know, we uh, greet uh, those returned from Iraq, Afghanistan, and have, you know, but <coughs> Vietnam is a little different. I, uh, and I always feel, I always have a special place 
in my heart for the Vietnam veteran because the experience coming home was very different. It wasn't mm -hmm. a thank you it wasn't a, right. you know hands out welcome back to the united states thank you for your service and in fact in some cases met with some hostility well yeah <clears throat> fortunately i can say that i was never confronted directly with somebody throwing rocks at me or cursing me or anything like that because i was in an environment uh, first of all uh, atlanta a southern city where people tended to be uh, more patriotic but I was also surrounded, all of my colleagues were people who had just got out of what I'd been doing. They were all people who had just gotten out of the military uh, and going, were going to work for the airline. So we, uh, uh, we didn't run in the situation with having to socialize or being in a social situation with a lot of those folks. But I know, I mean, you'd have to be a blind man to know that it didn't go on a lot. Uh, and even today, I, I deal with veterans' issues, uh, talk to veterans' groups all the time, all kinds of veteran, veterans' groups, and people uh, on active duty. Uh, when I first uh, met with a group of Vietnamese veterans a couple of years ago, um, they had their tradition of when you meet, they, they say, welcome home. And it kind of took me back when I first heard this guy say, welcome home to me. I thought, what's he talking about? That is their tradition because nobody, when they came home, said to them, welcome home. So now whenever they greet each other, that's what they do, even today. And, the, and this was the first war where post-traumatic stress disorder was sort of recognized uh, to some extent. Recognized to some extent, but uh, I don't think as much as it is today, uh, as people talk about it, you realize it's had many different names over many different wars, but it's still the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, combat fatigue, it's shell shock, it's post-traumatic stress syndrome now, but it's, it's all the same stuff. I remember and my father in World War II had night terrors, and uh, they didn't have the name for it. But, uh, um, so, uh, we just had two minutes left. Oh, okay. Uh, just real quickly then. Can you, and this is for future generations, this interview, and thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. um, what, what did the military service do for you, and what, what's your takeaway, and what can you say to future generations about the military? Uh, well, I, I think nearly everybody who's been in the military is proud of their military service. I think it changes your outlook. Uh, it, it teaches you a lot of things. It teaches you patience, which, which a lot of people don't have, even as uh, senior adults. Uh, it teaches you endurance. It teaches you, as I said a minute ago, that you can, you can do a lot of things and endure a lot of things that you didn't think you could do or endure. Uh, and, and I think it's a great experience for nearly every person, man or woman, in the transition from schoolboy to adult life to go through that kind of thing. Uh, I think it equips you well for uh, uh, what you're going to face later on in life. And I'd say another thing, it's not strictly a training or experience uh, like that. It's also, a, it's also very good uh, as a training ground for future life. I mean, I was 25 years old, 25 years old, and here I was flying a C-130 across the Pacific Ocean to Vietnam with a crew of five people. I was in command of that at 25 years old. How many chances in the civilian world are you going to get to uh, be in that kind of leadership position? So the military thrusts a lot on you. They expect a lot of, of you uh, at a very early age, and it's just here it is. You have to take it and run with it and see if you if you if you can do it. Let me just say thank you for your service and uh, welcome home. And, and um, you obviously have. have uh, been a real champion for veterans. I think yeah. I'm very proud to live in a city that has been recognized by the Department of Defense with the Freedom Award right. that accepted. I think the only city in the in the country. It is the only city in the country that has been given that award. Yeah. We're proud of that, and it's right out there in my case. By the way, we'll take a look at it when we get out of here. That sounds great. Well, you uh, thank you so much for your service, and uh, it's been a real honor to have this interview with you. Well, it's been an honor to do it and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. That's great. <clears throat>